Long before there was a country called Canada, there were many nations living across this land. Fast forward a century and a half, and through some deeply problematic history, it's not surprising that indigenous people have complicated views about the 150th anniversary of Confederation. Joining us now to share some of those views in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Nigan Sinclair, Associate Professor and Acting Head, Department of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba, and here in our studio, Vanessa Watts, Acting Director, Indigenous Studies Program at McMaster University in Hamilton, and author and playwright Drew Hayden-Taylor, whose most recent book is Take Us to Your Chief and Other Stories, and whose new play, Sir John A., Acts of a Gentrified Ojibwe Rebellion, will be mounted at the National Arts Centre in Ottawa this fall. Can't wait to see that. Good luck with that. Thanks, everybody, for being on our program tonight. I want to start, Nigam, with you first and ask, what does Canada 150 mean to you? Uh, well, Canada 150 is, uh, is a contradiction of sorts because those of us who have been living in the country for you know, all of our lives, we've, uh, we've faced tremendous violence and uh, what many people call genocide over the past, you know, our lives and also our ancestors' lives. But also many Indigenous people have participated very deeply in this country's history. My grandfather fought in World War II, for example. And so we're kind of at a, at a contradiction. We feel a lot of contradictions over our history, our own history and our relationships within the country embodied mostly by the treaties. And then the other parts, which are the violence and genocide of the residential school era and the Indian Acts and so on. So a lot of us feel very vexed about this time. Vexed, okay. Vanessa Watts, what would your view be? Um, I would I would agree with um, with Nigan and say also that uh, Canada wouldn't be a country without the dispossession of Indigenous lands. So in celebrating Canada, uh, we can't ignore the fact that Canada was built on upon dispossession. It's also built upon treaties, which ironically are uh, an acknowledgement and recognition of Indigenous lands, but those have largely gone unnoticed. So I would say it is a very um, you said complicated time. It is complicated, but it's also clear, I think, very clear in terms of um, how Canada formed as a nation and what is being celebrated. Drew? Uh, I agree with uh, these two. It is very complex, very com complicated. Um, I, For me personally, uh, Canada 150 doesn't mean much other than it's an opportunity to sit and write and talk about it and explore it. On one hand, you've got people who are completely against it, uh, Ryan McMahon, Christy Belcourt, and on the other hand, you've got people who have embraced it and um, are using it as a forum to celebrate their own culture and their own people's achievements. So I think it just sets up a wonderful opportunity for discussions like this. That's why we're doing it here tonight. Do you, Nigan, identify as a Canadian? Uh, well, I would, I would identify as Anishinaabe. However, uh, I've been in lots of those kinds of situations. I happen to have children. I have an 11-year-old and a 3-year-old where both of them kind of ask, uh, what do we do about Canada? And uh, what I say is that, uh, you know, our families have very deep ties to the country. And so I do things like stand up for the national anthem. But I do, however, uh, have, uh, I don't refer to myself as a Canadian. However, there are times when people are at, you know, hold guns at borders where you're forced to make a choice. And, and so you're kind of strategic with your choices on that. I, I guess it's a particularly interesting question, I think, anyway, for you, because your dad's a senator. I mean, your dad is the legendary Murray Sinclair, who is a member of the Senate of Canada right now, which is about as, you know, I mean, that's as into politics as you want to get in the country. So when you have these conversations with him, how do you resolve that question with him? Well, I'm also a taxpayer, uh, let's, and so is he. And so, I mean, we, we are in these kind of interesting intersections of relationships today. And speaking with my father, of course, my father's always been in, emboldened by a sense, a sense of resistance, but also a sense of struggle for us as a people, um, just in terms of land or more children in care or, or violence against Indigenous women. It, those are the struggles that we face here in 2017. So we're constantly undergoing a resistance to the ongoing narrative of Canada, which is the unity and the kind of syrupy sweet Sweetness of the flag, and we uh, for just for us being here, uh, we are the resistance against Canada 150. Well, if you look across the country nowadays, Vanessa, you will see, of course, logos and celebrations and festivals and signs all over the highways. Canada 150. Sheldon, bring up this one that um, we saw this in Nova Scotia, and here's a sign that says Canada 150, <laughs> Mi'kmaqi 13,000. In other words, there has been an indigenous presence here for just slightly longer than um, Confederation. Well, actually, um, you know, almost 13,000 years longer than Confederation. <laughs> I want to get a sense from you about to what extent within the indigenous world in Canada, uh, there is a debate about how to approach Canada 150. 
Uh, the debates I've heard are, I mean, largely, I think Indigenous peoples are resistant to celebrating Canada 150. And I think some, as Drew has said, are really uh, committed to showcasing um, our traditional governance systems, our political views, our philosophies as a way to speak back to Canada 150. So um, I don't know that. I think the debate <clears throat> is there, but I think both are, are approaching from the same way in a sense. That is, Indigenous peoples have been here longer. Canada is a very young country, and we, you know, for me and my opinion is is that Canada, um, you know, can't take our ways of seeing the world and viewing the world as part of the cultural mosaic. I think that does a disservice to the nation-to-nation -nation relationship we have as seeing ourselves as distinct. So what I'm seeing through the logos and the signs a lot is this kind of tendency towards adopting um, Indigenous ways of seeing the world as part of that mosaic to kind of um, to make things a little more shiny and to make things a little more interesting. But the message here clearly is not this stuff's only 150 years old. Well, this exactly. stuff goes way back. Way back and beyond yeah. 13,000 years. Indeed. Drew, I want you to tell us a bit about Vancouver, which almost did not participate in Canada 150, mm. but Indigenous leaders stepped in, and what happened next? Well, first of all, going back to the what you just showed up there about the 13,000 versus the 150, who of us haven't shaved a few years off our age? <laughs> <laughs> so that's all that's going on here. Right? Uh, anyways, back to your original question. Um, from what I understand, um, the, the city of Vancouver was, was reluctant or concerned about um, the, the image of participating in, in Canada 150 from the Aboriginal perspective. And I have to applaud them in order to sort of investigate po uh, the possibilities. They went to the Native communities in and around Vancouver and found out that they wanted to participate, they were interested in participating, giving it a uniquely Indigenous spin. And as a result, it has um, morphed into this, as this celebration of, of Canada and the Indigenous culture. In fact, aren't they calling it, uh, was it Canada 150 plus hmm. or something like that? So that's all to the good, I think. I think it's for the good. Yeah. Uh, anything, anything that generates um, um, working together, uh, building bridges and providing the opportunity for two cultures that have not always, shall we say, lived cooperatively together uh, to do something like this is always positive. Mm -hmm. Nigan, let me get you to comment on something I'm about to read here. This is uh, the Minister of Heritage for Canada, Melanie Jolie, who had this to say a few months back. We know that the relationship with our Indigenous groups, our Indigenous groups, that's not a really <laughs> great thing to say, but anyway, and communities in the past 150 years has not really not been perfect. We're committed as a government to make sure that the next 150 years are way better. So this is exactly why we made sure that in the context of Canada 150, we would celebrate the reconciliation with Indigenous people. How would you, Nigan, characterize the efforts within Canada 150 to sort of include and accommodate Indigenous voices and perspectives? Well, I think, Steve, what you picked up on in the quote, uh, which has a similar sounding to what the Governor General recently said, um, the, you know, Indigenous peoples, this entire country for 150 years has been built off the backs of Indigenous people. And Indigenous peoples have been really treated as a sort of a mining resource. Uh, there are things to take from, you know, uh, resources to take from, words to take from. On every Canadian driver's license right now, there is the reminder that there are important things like Indigenous languages or relationships or treaties. And you know, if there's anything that Canada 150 has has perhaps not done quite as well, and I certainly haven't seen it, is the reminder that while the syrupy sweetness of the flag or the maple leaf is important to talk about, how we got there, uh, who was whose land was was taken from in order to make that maple syrup, is probably the most important discussion of all. And to truly be Canadian is to be a complex peoples, mm. and any sense of a unitary narrative, a unifying narrative, which talks about only those parts that ended up in what we might think of as UN peacekeepers without talking about the fact that Indigenous people taught Canada what UN peacekeeping was all about is to tell a narrative that's one-sided and, and frankly not helpful. Vanessa, I, I mean you heard me pick up on that our Indigenous groups and uh, I haven't spoken to the Minister about this, I have no idea whether, mm -hmm. I, I mean I, I think I'm on solid ground in saying she probably wasn't trying to convey right. a perpetuation of, colo of a colonial sure. attitude by a Minister of the Crown sure. to Indigenous peoples and let's also recognize she's in her second language there, she's a Francophone uh, politician so she, you know, she may not have understood the nuance of what she was saying. Having said that, 
You don't like that expression, do you? I saw you bristle at it when I read it as well. No, and I think it's far too common, actually. I yeah. think that that happens a lot amongst politicians, um, referencing our First Nations, our Aboriginal people, and it goes back to this discussion against kind of the, the, the nuance and the interesting complexities of a Canadian cultural mosaic or multicultural mosaic, which, um, you know, I, I don't agree with in terms of the relationship between Indigenous peoples and Canada. And, and certainly when Egon referenced, you know, building Canada off the backs of Indigenous people and taking those lands, and that's not just historical, that's currently happening. And this new kind of form of reconciliation is emerging. Um, you know, I've heard terms economic reconciliation. I've heard things like Indigenous youth are the fastest growing population and they are going to be um, the ones that kind of jump into the economy, right? So for me, they're human capital, and that's how Indigenous peoples are still being talked about. Even with residential schools, it was Indigenous youth being viewed as laborers, and that narrative hasn't changed. In fact, it's now re-inscribing um, itself within this notion of reconciliation. So just so I'm clear, you're not trying to put a chill on free speech, but you are trying to point out mm -hmm. the nuances behind some fairly frequently used expressions right. which may pack a bigger wallop than people realize. So, right, right. So. I mean, our is the, the possessive. Mm. And, and given the paternalistic relationship that historically has been present and it continues to be present with the Indian Act and other politicians, um, you know, it, it does mean a lot. It's not just a slip of the tongue. True. Let me read this to you. This is from the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation <laughs> Commission, which characterized Canada 150 as an opportunity for Canadians to take stock of the past celebrating the country's accomplishments without shirking responsibility for its failures. I guess a two-part question here. Uh, does that sound about right to you? <laughs> well, As a mission statement. Entire libraries have been written on, on deconstructing that and the rest of the TRC. Um, these are good words. Whether they're good actions is another matter. Well, that's the qu second question, which is, do you think that can be done? All of the above. I am, uh, I like to see, look at the world through rose-tinted glasses. I like to think all things are possible. It's up to the individuals, it's up to the government, and it's up to the people whether or not they do achieve this. I like to think it is possible. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of restructuring of, um, of uh, systematic views of, of life, but I'm going to say yes, but we're not there yet. Yes, but. Nigan, you know, there are obviously millions of Canadians who would like to celebrate the fact that Confederation happened 150 years ago and that we're a, relatively speaking, successful example of a democratic society around the world. Can, can Canada do that, celebrate its accomplishments, while at the same time acknowledging the failures along the way? Oh, uh, absolutely. In fact, I, uh, I hearken back to what Drew said a moment ago about this is an opportunity for dialogue. That's the thing that I've said uh, over and over and over again in the many, many uh, times I've been asked to comment on Canada 150 is, is there's nothing wrong with celebrating a Canadian like Romeo Dallaire or Nellie McClung or insert any other Canadian, great Canadian in their accomplishment. However, it is, it is at the same time equally as important to talk about how did we get here? How did we get here to have those kinds of Canadians who achieve these great things on either the national, local, in, international stage? They got here, they own houses, they have citizenship, they live under laws and policies which have all been built on the backs of Indigenous people. And the Indigenous peoples have participated in those things, helping them, helping the country build. And so that narrative is so important because it is truly to be um, a Canadian is to understand that we actually had a path in which we got here and that path was not particularly rosy. So if we're not talking about the rosy stuff, we need to really talk about how we got to the rosy stuff. Not taking anything away from what he just said, Vanessa, mm -hmm. do you think there are accomplishments in a 150-year-old confederation that are worth celebrating? Well, I mean, if we're talking about accomplishments with Indigenous people, then I would say uh, context is really important. So I would say, for example, the TRC was an accomplishment, but it was an accomplishment brought forth by class action lawsuits of survivors and the Canadian government not wanting to go uh, through court. You know, so the duty to accommodate and consult, that was through the Haida decision in 2000. Indigenous peoples having to push that through the court. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, something that should be celebrated in 1982. 
uh, those rights didn't apply on reserve. Um, there was still gender discrimination going on and violations of treaties. So do I think there's been accomplishments? Yes, I think there's been accomplishments. Do I think that they can be celebrated at the same time, um, given what we're talking about? Not if the truth isn't being told about how those accomplishments came to be or the impacts or the inequities of those accomplishments. Okay, okay, again, I hear you loud and clear. Yep. Take the Indigenous lens off of what you just said, though. Are there okay. accomplishments in a 150-year-old <laughs> confederation luck. that have nothing to do with Indigenous people that are worth celebrating? Okay, well, I would need an example of that. I mean, because I don't know what an example would be that didn't impact Indigenous peoples in some way. I mean, I, I can't think uh, of Let one. me give you the most cliched example. Okay. Medicare. There's people all over the world who think we've got, you know, one of the better healthcare systems going. You willing to grant that? No. I mean, I think about um, the man who walked into the hospital room emergency who ended up dying in the emergency room because he was basically ignored because somebody thought that he was a drunken Indian. So Sleeping it off. Right, right. sleeping in it fact, off. He just was dying. Him, exactly, he was dying. So no, I would have to say I disagree with that. Okay, I mean, a anybody can always give one example of something that's an anomaly no. to a thing. Sure. So is that what you just did? No. I would say, I mean, go go up north to different reserves, go down south to different reserves, and, and let's see the healthcare access on reserve. I mean, researchers spend so much time having to uh, try to get Canada to change its healthcare policy with Indigenous peoples all throughout Canada. So First Nations, Inuit, and Métis face that discrimination within the healthcare system, both on reserve and off reserve. Gotcha. So I would still disagree. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything about Canada at 150 that you, Drew, take pride in? Uh, going back to what Nigan was saying, I mean, um, and, and your original question, um, I think there are a lot of countries in this world whose um, treatment of its indigenous people, uh, either if they don't border on, are completely genocidal in nature. So I'm aware of that when I, when I talk about Canada. However, um, there has, have been so many elements in our culture. I mean, I, like, I did a play on, on Sir John A. Macdonald, who is the first Minister of Indian Affairs, and he practically starved many um, prairie uh, nations into submission. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, through, during his reign, the start of the reserve system, the residential school system, which begat uh, this, which begat that, which begat that, and all down the road. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of issues that need to be addressed as part of this whole thing. I like to refer to it as post-contact stress disorder. Post-contact stress disorder, okay. Yes. That's, that's now, but getting back to your question, um, th that's, a good, that's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer off the top of my head, because that's a, that's a, that's, that would take some serious sitting down and pondering, mm -hmm. um, because almost everything I could come up with, or you could come up with, would have a twinge of negativism in it towards Native people. But what you were talking about, Medicare, you look at the, the health of, of, of Native people across Canada. I mean, we have our, our life expectancy substantially less than um, the national rate, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, Medicare is wonderful and great, and yay, Canada. Mm -hmm. But uh, then you look at you, plaster all that stuff about our, our people, our health, our culture onto that, and um, it's a little less rosy. Well, Nigan, let me try this with you. The <clears throat> Government of Canada, on the 21st of June, uh, taking quite a departure from the history books, decided to rename the Langevin Block at, in Ottawa on Parliament Hill, w which had been named that for obviously a very long time. Uh, they decided to rename it uh, after the Prime Minister's office. And Hector Louis Langevin, who was the father of the residential school system, strong proponent, I guess we should say, of the residential school system, uh, that name is now gone uh, off that building. What did you think of the decision? Uh, I, sorry, Steve, I just want to say one thing about Medicare for a second. I, I tried <laughs> intervening a little bit earlier. Just one thing about that is, is uh, the social welfare state was introduced by Indigenous people. If we, if we left uh, Western Europeans to devising Canada, uh, we would have a feudal system. We would have a very hierarchical system, which in many ways we do. But the social welfare system, the idea that we take care of everyone, that is an Indigenous concept. And so Indigenous peoples introduced that concept. So there are pretty many parts about Medicare in which to be proud of. Now, getting to your question. Um, 
uh, but I mean, actually, but many parts to be proud of, but to tell the, the indigenous parts of them, that is actually what is the most important thing of all. Now to get to your question about renaming things, renaming monuments, for example, it is of crucial importance that we as Canada reconcile our past, where understand, understand that we come from a complex history that have involved, frankly, um, some very violent individuals who have pursued some very violent ends to means. But at the same time, being able to talk about that history honestly and openly is of crucial nature. And we may discover that, that our national so-called heroes within the country um, have some very complex past to them. And so that may involve re-envisioning. And so I don't have a problem with renaming that building. Uh, I don't have a problem with renaming, for exact, example, Ryerson, Edgar Ryerson, or, or Sir John A. Macdonald. I mean, these are things, but the real absence is, if you look across the country, the real absence is about the Indigenous contributions to the country, which have been monumental, which have literally changed the aspect of every life have we, as we've dem demonstrated in the Medicare debate. Well, all right, consistent with Medicare, let's note that 45 minutes from this studio, on a good day, probably an hour and 15 on a bad day, given traffic these days, you'll find Joseph Brandt Hospital in Ham uh, Burlington. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I presume you approve of that. Well, I, I think we should be talking about Indigenous people much more in the country. In fact, that's what I've been doing for the past year of my life, is going around to school divisions all across the country, saying, what are the parts of you that are referring to Indigenous, and how are you also not just speaking about to Indigenous young people, but to non-Indigenous young people, of how crucial their identities are in ties, and their ties to Indigenous peoples, and what are the contributions there? Because to be Canadian is to be, to be innately influenced and constructed by Indigenous people taking Hector Louis Langevin's name off that prime ministerial building? Yeah, What's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense. Um, I think that it's unfortunate in a way that these things don't happen without some sort of protest or demand for, from Indigenous politicians or Indigenous Is that groups. what happened here? Yeah, I believe so. Um, and so when that happened, that request came to Prime Minister Trudeau and he announced that on um, Aboriginal Day, I think that does send a great message. But I also think that um, having to make change or, or, or Canada needing to make change based on Indigenous peoples providing a particular critique rather than Canada saying, hey, we are aware of this critique and this history and we um, want to talk about this and offer this rather than Indigenous peoples having asked for it. It's like the Supreme Court system. There's always this kind of asking, demanding situation. Okay, but then the next question becomes, Drew, how far do you want to go? Do you want Sir Johnny McDonald's name taken off every statue and building and street name and so on in the country? I think that would be highly unlikely. <laughs> Never, but would it be desirable from your point of view? I don't, uh, I, I don't want to impose my um, lens, uh, views of history mm -hmm. and, 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 and issues with historical figures on other people. Um, I'm sure there's a sizable population out there that has uh, great respect for John A. and want to honor him. That's fine. That's that's their business. As I said, I researched him for my play, and um, he was deficient in many areas. He was flawed. He was like a lot of people, and um, he had a vision. He managed to achieve his vision, but so did Louis Riel, who did not, and had, was was persecuted because of his vision. Um, I, I would like love to see a. a a uh, statue of Louis Riel right beside John A. Macdonald. Hmm. Wouldn't that and be interesting? That would be fine, and then you just give them like a, a, a wooden stick and see who wins. <laughs> well, given that Macdonald was responsible for hanging Riel till exactly. he, to his death, that would be interesting. Don't you, do you, do you, are you concerned at all that you suffer from presentism? You are asking today's leaders to ascribe to people 150 years ago a level of empathy and understanding that could not have been possible 150 years ago? No, because, um, I mean, it was very clear that when the treaties were made, uh, there, there was the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which very clearly laid out how land was to be negotiated with Indigenous peoples if Canada sought to make itself a nation. So there was no suffering of, like, well, we didn't know that this is uh, maybe what we should do, or, or we're in a different time that doesn't reflect these kind of progressive views that will come down in the future. I mean, it was very clear, okay. actually. Let me I do love, I, if I may, I love that, con that, that concept of uh, you have to look at it in context. Mm -hmm. Or he was a man of his time, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. I did, and so in, in the play I'm working on, one of the characters basically says, so if I do something really horrible now, in 150 years it'll be okay. I'll just be viewed as a man of my times. <laughs> 
There's a reason you're a playwright, you know? <laughs> yes, I can see it. Uh, okay, let me read this here, and then I'll get Negan to comment on this first. 2015, a debate to erect statues of some of Canada's prime ministers at Wilfrid Laurier University, including Sir John A. In the end, they were not installed. Here's Christopher Dummett, who's a professor of Canadian studies at Trent University, writing on that debate and Canada 150. Mm -hmm. A couple of months ago, he said, I was the only person in the room to suggest that having statues of Canadian prime ministers was not intrinsically offensive. The case I tried to make was that Canadian history was complex, that Canadian leaders had multiple legacies, which couldn't be judged on single criteria. We can simultaneously commemorate the history of the Canadian state and political leadership and still be aware of the darker side of our history. Even if we don't want to celebrate Canada 150, we ought to be open to why others might want to do so and not assume that celebration is itself intrinsically a display of ignorance or worse. Negan, your view of that comment. Well, I mean, nations change all the time. And, you know, I, th I think we sort of have this weird strain of our conversation as if Sir Johnny is going to go away. Um, you only have to look at any textbook. You only have to look at any Canadian classroom or history class or any aspect of the country, any bill, any law. Sir Johnny Macdonald's not going away. I mean, he is a permanent fixture within this country. And, and it's perhaps uh, naive to think that by removing him off the building or, or renaming a building is somehow going to affect that legacy in some way. It's mm -hmm. also important to say that, you know, if we are going to talk about the country, we have to think that our country is moving. And if there is, you know, so-called national heroes, if the people, that's the people we're going to hold up and we're going to talk about, then what is the narrative that we're doing when we continue to perpetuate the narrative of 150 years ago of these individual so-called men of their time, regardless of their complexities, if we keep reinscribing that story, but to completely missing out on the uh, many other con contributors, Tecumseh, for example, like Tecumseh, um, the great Shawnee leader, is the whole reason we're not Ameri we're not flying American flags right now. Um, it, there is a reason why Indigenous people contributed to this country, and that story is probably the most important thing I think Canadian young people need to hear today. So for me, that's the story that I'm interested in telling now, because frankly, that's the part that's been missing for virtually all of my life and, and continues to be today. I am down to my last half minute here, so let me give 10 seconds to each of you. Nigun, to you first. What are you going to do on... July 1st, 150th anniversary of Confederation. Well, my family holds a reunion every year, and what we do is we were a removed people, and uh, we return to the site of our removal, and we occupy it. We refuse to leave, and we hold celebration and love and share food and uh, remind Canada we're still here. Vanessa. Well, I'll probably take my kids for a walk in the bush, and then I'm going to keep writing and, and writing about um, sovereignty and writing about Haudenosaunee sovereignty and writing about how our ways are alive and distinct and will continue. So not going to Parliament Hill, not going to Queen's Park, not going I'm to City. I'm going to pass. You're going to pass on that. True. Well, this is kind of, I don't know, embarrassing or empowering, but my birthday is actually July 1st. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, Are you shaving a few years off your birthday as well? <laughs> I, I hope there's this, much, uh, this amount of controversy when I turn 150. <laughs> um, but uh, I will probably be home on the reserve with my feet up, uh, having some friends over for my birthday and seeing uh, how many uh, pairs of socks my family gave me. <laughs> okay, terrific. I want to thank all three of you for coming in tonight and helping us out with this discussion. Negan Sinclair, the Associate Professor and Acting Head, Department of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. Thanks, Negan, for being there from Winnipeg for us. Vanessa Watts, the Acting Director of the Indigenous Studies Program at McMaster University in the Steel City, as we used to call it. Mm -hmm. Now I guess it's the healthcare city. That's the biggest employer there now. Mm -hmm. And Drew Hayden-Taylor, novelist, playwright, documentarian, author of Take Us to Your Chief and Other Stories. And we look forward to seeing his work on Sir Johnny MacDonald at the National Arts Centre coming up this fall. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.